Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I am Ian Kavat. The U.S. has approved a 300 million U.S. dollar sale to enhance Taiwan's four Cs, command, control, communications and computers, which will boost the effectiveness of Taiwan's battlefield awareness. What implications does this sale hold in the context of the upcoming election in Taiwan? Joining us today are Vincent Chow, Taipei City Councillor, and Arthur Ding, National Zhengzhou University Professor Emeritus. Very warm welcome to you both onto the show. Arthur Ding, let me come to you first. So this investment focuses on providing life cycle support for Taiwan's 4C capabilities. Can you give us an assessment on what this means exactly and what are the benefits? Okay, about uh, 20 years ago, during probably beginning from President Chen Shui-bing era, United States se uh, sell, uh, sold the uh, so-called command control system to Taiwan. And uh, now it's 20 years uh, after now. So, no, it's most of kind of a, uh, we call the link 16, uh, it's kind of a command control, which can detect and uh, relay all the, you know, the, the, the enemy's uh, activities and operation. And uh, through this kind of a, uh, systems, all the tactical uh, units in our militaries, including Air Force, uh, Navy, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, ground force, they can uh, share this kind of information and uh, make the, the, the better uh, decision you know, which uh, units should launch the, the, uh, our you know, activities so and so forth. Mm. But now it has been 20 years. Mm. So uh, through these 20 years, you know, we know that the, the Beijing, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, they also made a progress, made a modernization for their military force. Mm. So, uh, this uh, so-called simplified link 16 version of the command control system really need to be updated mm -hmm. and uh, to be modernized. Mm -hmm. So you know, the term life cycle means that uh, you know it's kind of a system which need to be updated and uh, need to be modernized so that uh, you can cope with the most current uh, the problem and the issues mm -hmm. so that we can compete and. Uh, can outcompete mm. the Chi Chinese counterpart. To the lat latest possible version, yeah, yeah, because Vincent, I heard that um, the current system doesn't actually recognize the newest weapons Taiwan has, including its indigenous uh, weapons. Is that it, it, it doesn't recognize non-US weapons. Yeah, I think, I think so this is co connected to a program we call Xing'an Jihua. So the Xing'an Jihua is the overarching, um, just basically foresees uh, communication platform we have here in Taiwan. Now, I think the criticism is where that previously, so Link 16 is an evolution of what we used to call the Link 11 system. The Link 11 system was basically a post-World War II system, very, mm. very old, very antiquated. Mm. Uh, obviously, we don't have the 11 system. We have the 16 system, which mm. is updated to NATO standards, I think in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and now, obviously, there is a new Link 22 system, which is, I think is what Professor Ding also alluded to. Now, obviously, I think the ideal would be to have the most recent system here in Taiwan. But as we know, I mean, to be realistic, any FMS, um, foreign military sale Taiwan engages in, has complexities. Mm. And uh, the complexities are inherent in the link systems because they're essentially NATO-based systems. And they're the common platforms for NATO countries. Now, Taiwan isn't a member of NATO. And so I'm, I'm, I'm unclear whether that prevents Taiwan from accessing the newest link system mm. or if there are other updates to the link 16 system in this newest FMS that would bring it on par or at least similar mm. in terms of capability to the newest system. That's unclear at this point. However, I will say that I have seen the news to su that suggests that there is a serious need of updating in mm. terms of our current communication platforms. And I'm hopeful that this current um, FMS case we have ahead of us is $300 million provides support for that. Um, Arthur Ding, um, it's going to arrive by the end of 2023. What we do know um, is that there will be 26 US government contractors, uh, sorry, staff, and 83 contractors uh, available for technical assistance. Um, is there anything else in the detail of this deal that sticks out for you? Well, you know, the, the, the media release does not give us very detailed information on you know, what, what the so-called life cycle support means. But looking at the, the, the number of the staff you know, by the, sent by the U.S. government and uh, sent by the contractor, it should be a, a, a not small uh, update project, mm -hmm. I would say, because yeah. those 83 so-called sent from the contract, defense contractors, they are, I, I guess they are all 
the technical people. Mm. They know how to do the so called the software update, so and so forth. Mm. And uh, you know, this involved the so called export control. So export control is a, is a job by the, done by the government administration mm. uh, sector. So I guess you know that's why you know U.S. government sent another twenty six uh, government employee mm. to 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 work with the eighty three so that they can assure the 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 export control requirement can be met mm. and will not uh, you know, violate the so-called relevant uh, export control law. Yeah. Mm, okay. Now, now, Vincent, you mentioned uh, it, this is a desperately needed upgrade, um, but post the Biden-Xi summit um, in the US, how may this arms deal be seen from Beijing? Sir? I mean, I, I have to say that the, the, the biggest striking point about this arms sales really is timing. I mean, this is about a mid-cycle, uh, mi mid-life cycle kind of support case. It's not super exciting. It's not super sexy. Mm. But it's, I think the timing is worth noting because, number one, it comes after this summit that we mm. saw uh, in the sidelines of APEC. But also, number two, it comes pretty close to our own presidential elections. And for me, that suggests one thing, which is the normalization of arms sales continues unabated, regardless of which circumstance the two leaders meet and regardless of what domestic um, itineraries we have on the horizon. And, and I think this is precisely what is necessary because we have to rise above the political fray when it comes to um, things Taiwan needs, particularly in the defense industry. Mm. And so, um, and we have, there's a bit of history here, as you know, Yin, which is that prior uh, to the Tsai administration, uh, during President Ma ying as well as President Obama, there was this idea of bundling packages together uh, for fear of, uh, or, or for the willingness to find a so-called better time to engage in arms sales. So you would, what you'd see the whole year's worth of arms sales bundled together into one package. Now the problem with this is that number two, it neglects Taiwan's defense agency. So we need specific programs and packages at a specific time, mm -hmm. not when it's politically convenient for you to sell it. But number two, which is that there's never a good time when it comes to US-China relations. And so in past years, we've seen this breakdown back into this normalization of basically requests go in, they're processed in a timely manner, and they're sold uh, when they needed to be sold rather than bundled together. Mm. And so for me, that is probably the biggest striking aspect of this, which is that, again, the U.S. is making clear that nothing changes. Mm. APEC doesn't change it. Domestic mm. circumstances in Taiwan doesn't change it. Arm sales will continue regardless of politics. Mm. Okay, very strong message there. Um, Professor Ding, so Taiwan's um, defense ministry has noted an increase in the number of um, incursions into the, the airspace around uh, Taiwan, into Taiwan's um, ADIZ. Now, in particular, recently, uh, there were 10 uh, crossings of the median line. That was on, on December 16th. So how can you interpret this? Do you think this is a response to that arms sale? Well, uh, I guess, you know, the China Chinese People Liberation Army has its own agenda for the training, for exercise, you know, so uh, they have uh, their own agenda and uh, they to, to uh, and all this agenda to make a, pr a planning ahead of time. You know? mm. So um, uh, they probably, I, I think the Chinese military probably don't know that the U.S. government will release this kind of arms sale, this package of arms sale. So I, I guess this is kind of a somewhat coincident. To right. some extent, it's kind of coincident because, as I say, China, Chinese military has its own agenda. But uh, although it's kind of coincident, but uh, you know, so this kind of uh, uh, encouraging uh, Chinese can uh, make propaganda say, okay, we don't like you know the, this arms sale. You know, they can. Uh, 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 Make the queue say because of the arms sale, so we 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 fly into Taiwan ADI in order to protect. You know. So, uh, so I, I my guess is that it's more of kind of a coincidence. But the Chinese can definitely they can you know take advantage of these events to you know to make their own propaganda. Mm, okay, Vincent, do you want to comment on on that um, coincidence or or message? I think, I mean, mm. we talked about the regularization of mm. arms sales. I think what we've seen on the other side is also regularization of military intimidation and coercive action. So, mm. uh, I mean, this isn't exactly new. We've seen um, military overflights in over our ADIs for most months over the past year or so. Mm. And certainly, I do agree with Professor Ding that I don't think it's necessarily coordinated as a huge protest against what really is, again, mm. a $300 million communication right. system. It's not. Mm. Um, I think it's nothing new in that respect, mm -hmm. but certainly I think the Chinese, as Arthur said, would use this as an opportunity to mm -hmm. say, hey, we've expressed our displeasure, and their target is not only internationally, don't forget, it's domestically, mm -hmm. to show their domestic audience that 
they have um, showed consequences for this arm sales. And I think that for them is probably the key point in terms of maintaining their political stability at this point. Mm, okay. Now, tensions between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait have become a matter of global concern. Reuters reports that nearly 60 large crude oil tankers travel daily between the Persian Gulf and Chinese ports, transporting almost half of China's oil needs. The route includes the Indian Ocean, which is predominantly U.S. controlled. The report says that should China initiate any military action against Taiwan, these tankers could become China's Achilles heel as Beijing lacks military bases in the region for support. Professor Ding, can you discuss the importance of Indian Ocean shipping lanes for the Chinese? Okay, now uh, we all know that China become the, the number one oil importer in the world now. Uh, uh, every year uh, they import about uh, 500 million ton of oil. Uh, and uh, and uh, around the 60 percent of those oil shipping routes going through the Indian Ocean. Mm. So you can see why the Indian Ocean is so important for China's uh, ship, uh, the oil shipping uh, mm. the, uh, the route. You know. mm. Mm. Uh, so that's why you know the, to some extent it's not exaggeration to to say that the you know the Indian Ocean is a, 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 a choke point mm. for China's. Uh, 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 Days and uh, live in the days to some extent, you know. Mm. So that's why, uh, uh, you know, it's that's why you know the the media pays so much attention to you know the the, the relationship between China's oil uh, uh, shipping route and the Indian Ocean that link the these two issues together. Mm. Yeah. So you d you agree that it, you think it's a strategic weakness point for for China? Uh, definitely, because you know, uh, you know, around sixty percent of the the the. China import uh, oil from, from overseas going mm. through the Indian Ocean. You know, mm. So, and uh, we know that uh, uh, China started to uh, uh, to have built the influence in Indian Ocean about uh, decades ago, mm. roughly decades ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, since year 2008, you know, China regularly sent the so-called anti uh, uh, a ship uh, flotilla to to the Indian Ocean and. Mm. Uh, so to to exact the so-called the anti-piracy operation. Mm. Uh, so in, uh, no, uh, although that you know the China still uh, in terms of influence is still relatively weak compared to India and the United States. Mm. So that's why uh, you know the uh, the Indian Ocean is really important for China's mm. uh, uh, the so-called uh, oil ship uh, route, mm. and it's it's uh, uh, what the the. Play a critical role for China's uh, economic development. Mm. Yeah. Vincent, the Pentagon's October 2023 report on Chinese military activities highlights almost 20 potential Chinese sites globally, which they believe Beijing has already made uh, overs overtures to to those countries. So let's take a look. Here we're showing sites along the Indian Ocean's periphery. They include Kenya, Tanzania, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Seychelles, Sri Lanka. My, Myanmar, Thailand, and Indonesia. Explain to us how these sites would um, offer strategic advantage. Well, so they're completely connected to this idea about uh, reducing China's vulnerabilities. And we had touched on those vulnerabilities a bit earlier. I mean, we're talking about 60 large oil tankers transversing every single day between the Persian Gulf and, and China. And, and they're going through basically the Indian Ocean. They're going through the Strait of Malacca. They're going through the South China Sea. Mm. And so it makes it extremely vulnerable because, again, I mean, this is about 60 percent of China's um, oil imports, about 20 percent, 17, 20 percent China's natural gas imports. I mean, without these shipments, China's economy grounds to a halt. Mm. And what does that mean for China, Chinese political stability, mm. social stability, economic mm. stability? So mm. I think their effort through the One Belt, One Road system has been trying to patch up those vulnerabilities. So you can see a pretty coordinated campaign. I mean, they have the South China Sea locked down pretty tight. They've engaged in past years basically on the Sri Lanka component. And Sri Lanka has included, for example, Chinese efforts to build ports there, to control ports there, to influence uh, their politics there. Uh, we, we talked about the Seychelles, and that's the, basically this, um, the Indian Ocean as well, but north to Pakistan as well. And then now we see in the Middle East, where China is also playing a growing role, including brokering, for mm -hmm. example, peace and brokering uh, economic deals with these Middle Eastern countries. So all in all to say that, first of all, it's true that um, I think any person looking at this would realize that basically this is China's Achilles heel. 
China's economy grounds to a halt. This is enormous leverage mm. that the West can use against China to deter military action over Taiwan Strait. But second, it's also true that China's engaged in all of these efforts to try to, you know, to, to try to patch up these vulnerabilities and ensure that this cannot be used as leverage. And so ultimately, I think it's going to come down to, you know, whose side is going to win. So I think the U.S. has been very smart all, all along, which is, you know, trying to, 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 to include India mm. in all of these strategic calculations. I mean, mm. renaming PAC fleet, the Indo-PAC, the mm. Indo-PACOM, mm. you know, renaming mm. this effort in DOD to bring in India together because India mm. plays a critical role in all of these discussions. Yeah, and, and an inspiration for that, though, we must mention was Abe Shinzo. Of Japanese, course. former Japanese um, Prime Minister as I mean, well. he was ahead of his time, visionary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Professor Ding, if I can ask the question straight out, so does this act as enough of a deterrent against Chinese attack on Taiwan? You know, is, it, is this what's holding them back? Yeah, uh, I guess, you know, the, the, uh, although we don't like China, but uh, they have 1.3 billion people. You know, there must be some kind of smart people they have to make a strategic assessment, you know, what is, what is their weakness and mm. with which place is the most weak, so on and so forth. So definitely they, they, know, they know quite well the, uh, the this kind of a very, uh, the, the oil shipping uh, mm. route is, is one of the, their major weakness. Yeah, and of course their um, oil demands are actually growing, yeah. aren't they? As, as, mm -hmm. um, as we go on, there are some figures that say that in 2023, China imported 12% more oil than it did um, the year yeah, before. Yeah, over 2022, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, obviously some of that is because they're taking advantage of the cheap sanctioned mm -hmm. uh, Russian oil. Um, Vincent, um, of course, there are other um, uh, elements to this story mm. because as well as uh, seeking those more permanent military bases, as we saw on the yeah. periphery um, of the Indian Ocean, um, how about, um, tell us about Russia's Siberian gas pipelines. There's also apparently Myanmar and Kazakhstan uh, pipelines that Chinese are building in order to get, <laughs> uh, you know, energy. I remember this one American scholar like commenting on um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine said it best, which is that in ten years' time, I mean, all Russia is going to be is China gas, China's gas station, and I think it's 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 actually proving to be the case because China is snapping up Russian natural gas. They're snapping up Russian uh, energy resources like there's no tomorrow mm. at this point because for them, again, it's a matter of national survival. If they um, are eager uh, to show some progress on a Taiwan issue. They have to, at the same time, show progress in reducing these vulnerabilities we had talked about earlier. And one point we had said was the 1.1 road system, which is fortifying this uh, economic uh, linkages throughout the Indian Ocean, but also fortifying the military angle of that as well. But the second part is obviously reducing their dependence on these oil tankers that transverse between the Persian Gulf and China. And to do that, they need Russia. And so you talked about all these new pipelines that they're building with Russia. That's precisely it. Because if they can get energy, particularly natural gas, directly piped in from Russia through friendly borders, through borders that no Western country can really touch, then that's economic security. And mm -hmm. they need economic security before they can engage in this so-called national security effort against Taiwan. So I will say that I think this is something that, you know, I've certainly spoken to a number of think tank experts on this issue that people are watching very, very closely because mm -hmm. it has its implications far beyond uh, Russia or China. And let me end with this part, which is that we talked about Chinese vulnerabilities, but it's also not just about plugging up China's own food. It's also introducing new vulnerabilities to the West because a lot of the shipping that we spoke about, for example, through the Strait of Malacca, through the South China Sea, that includes a lot of shipping to Japan, mm. to South Korea, mm. to the United States, to the West as well. And so if they can control these shipping lines effectively, they not only reduce their own vulnerabilities, but they introduce new variables to the West that they must consider before supporting Taiwan in any economic or uh, military action. Mm. Yeah, Professor Ding, good, good point. Um, if we talk about blockades, um, then we, we also know from past experience in the world wars that trying to blockade a single country um, is also um, not entirely straightforward. Um, so in the uh, Reuters report that we've mentioned, the experts indicate that um, you know, these millions of barrels of oil uh, might be at risk of being delayed. Um, let's talk through the scenarios, sunk or even captured um, uh, by uh, their adversaries, China's adversaries. Um, so in your view, how likely is, is that scenario of, of the West, let's say, using this against China? The, the West, you know, they know they make a different kind of strategic assessment. 
and uh, they make a, they have, I guess they have all kind of plans, scenario plan. But uh, were they really to launch this kind of uh, action, activity or operation against you know, the ch a Chinese oil tank? It's another matter because uh, uh, I, my own guess is that the, you know, the, the, because on the one hand, Chinese leaders, they also know quite well uh, their weakness in this kind of uh, uh, oil shipping uh, route. So uh, they got to be very uh, 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 cautious, take a very uh, cautious step toward the Taiwan, not to uh, irritate and, uh, and create a, a problem of their own now. So that's, I guess, you know, so the, the, this is, is a, a, a matter between the, the Chinese leader and the so-called Western country, you know. They watch each other and uh, to see how the, the, the other side take a, a so-called stupid action, then they'll take a, a react. So I, I guess, you know, so uh, 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 in a way, they, they have they have plan, they have assessment, and uh, probably they are just to wait and see to see how Beijing will, will act, and they will think over you know, how, how they should react. And uh, this in, in their so-called uh, national interest and uh, in the also for the peace and stability in this region. Mm. Vincent, because I mean, we've um, many, many media and analysts have talked about a potential blockade of Taiwan by China, but this, the tables could be turned <laughs> in this instance in terms of the Indian Ocean and the oil that's needed by China. Well, absolutely. I mean, China is as vulnerable to this as we are. I mean, even though China is not um, an island, but obviously they rely on global trade. I mean, they rely on exports getting out, they rely on imports getting in, particularly energy. So I think, I mean, if you look at China's vulnerability, it's clear. They have only about 60 days of crude oil, I mean, in their strategic reserves. They have next to no natural gas. I mean, natural gas, they're a bit better in terms of this being piped directly in from Russia, not being so subject to, for example, sea lanes, for example, but nevertheless, a vulnerability. Their agriculture, I mean, they're also reliant on basically, I mean, they're self-sufficient in some areas, but also not self-sufficient in other areas. So, I mean, this would have enormous economic costs for China. And let me be clear here. I mean, we're going to achieve peace and stability across the Taiwan trade when we can successfully increase the costs and risks of Xi Jinping taking action to an insurmountable degree. Mm -hmm. And all of this plays into it. So if, for example, there, the Chinese believe and the West has actually capabilities to carry out a blockade of China that would impact your energy supply, impact your food supply, promote economic uh, instability as well as block exports, then certainly that feeds into all of this cost and risk calculation. So, Last year, something happened, I think, for the first time, which is that the U.S. Um, Commission on China, as part of um, um, their Congress, mm -hmm. actually asked the U.S. military for a report on the capabilities it would actually need to engage on a military blockade mm -hmm. over China. So it shows that these ideas are being taken seriously at this point. Mm -hmm. Arthur Ding, fi very final question. Um, so going back to the China side, uh, we, we saw that they're, they're potentially looking at around 10 new sites for, I presume, more permanent or permanent military bases. How long does that sort of thing take to set up? And if they had 10, how does that compare with what the US has? Well, you know, the, the we talk about the China's intention to build, to develop and build so-called overseas base. But, uh, you know, it will take, first, it will take tremendous time and uh, money, resources. Mm -hmm. And the second is that, the, you know, the, uh, uh, on the other hand, we see you know the U.S. also uh, making tremendous effort to build the so-called uh, alliance and the coalition. The one of the most one is the so-called the uh, AUKUS, mm. and also the uh, uh, Quad to to build the relationship, closer relationship with India, so that India can play a major role in India and so on and so forth. So, uh, I guess you know, yeah, no doubt China can make effort to built overseas, particularly in the ocean, uh, uh, Indian Ocean uh, area. Mm. But on, we see that the U United States also t take a tremendous effort, try to take counter actions mm. to, uh, you know, to counter China's uh, uh, effort in this regard. So, um, um, you know, the, uh, to some extent, I would say the U.S. has its advantage because U.S. for a long time, U.S. have built the uh, the so-called overseas base mm -hmm. along uh, for a long time uh, along the so-called Indian Ocean. So, can China really compete and out-compete mm -hmm. the United States 
to be a more influence in, in Indian Ocean, I would say I think we will take take time to see. Yeah. Mm. Vincent, do you want to hazard a guess in terms of uh, the time frame, the years? I mean, we could look back at Djibouti being the first overseas base. That was uh, mid 2010s. Yeah. I think uh, China are we talking about decades no, or uh, uh, probably more to be honest because I think China is going to really struggle because if you look at Djibouti if you look at Sri Lanka I mean all of this took place in an environment that was very permissive to China doing these things that where I think democracies around the world weren't on guard for these on these actions and I think cases for example in the Solomon Islands do show that countries care more and more about what's happening on the one but one road on Chinese military expansionism on new military basing and there's no longer this view that China is benign and that these bases won't have security implications. So we saw the actions that not only the United States but Australia took to block this um, naval potential naval base in uh, Honiara uh, in the Solomon Islands. And I foresee that as China expands further in the region, they will face more and more of that concentrated pressure campaign to act against uh, China uh, supporting new military bases around the region. Mm, so increasing resistance for Beijing. Oh, yeah. We'll have to wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much, Vincent Chow and Arthur Ding, for joining Talks today. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.